So welcome to this recording of this webinar of differential diagnosis and manual therapy of the CTJ and TOS. This is a webinar series and we do these regularly to, to try to get people some relevant information that can uh, lead them to a better understanding of some of these difficult clinical problems we're having. Uh, a big shout out and thanks to Primal Pictures and Primal is a uh, one of our partners, strategic partners that ensures that some of the quality of to ensure the quality of our educational materials and they do a fantastic job. To learn more about them, go to our website and you'll get some more information about how Primal Pictures might be able to serve you in the clinic or in your educational environment. So as I mentioned, the webinar series is a sampling of IOMS courses uh, because we want to help people understand kind of the power of, of information and useful content um, on a relevant topic. We want to cover uh, not the entirety of the course, but we want to give you some clinical pearls to allow you to kind of frame up the the challenge of this of some of these clinical syndromes. Today's topic is thoracic outlet syndrome, and if you read my emails out to everybody, I wanted to frame it up pretty clearly. That the key things we're going to try to touch on is anatomy matters a lot. Uh, know the classifications because it's relevant so that you can understand what you're going to be able to help and not be able to help. Uh, pain, numbness, and tingling, oh, my, oh why. Now, if you got that, I'm impressed and I'm glad that you did because, of course, that could be lions, tigers, what is it? Lions, liars, ti lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. It was a takeoff on that, so if you laughed at that, I'm glad. Um, cervical thoracic junction is where the vertical chain meets the horizontal chain. This is important mechanically, and we'll talk about that. And I want to try to demystify this idea of, of the thoracic outlet syndrome. Let's start with a case history. First of all, most of our, our, our CTJ and our, and our uh, thoracic outlet syndrome patients don't look like this. But for the purposes of this uh, point, is let's say we have a 33-year-old female with gradual onset of bilateral forearm and hand tingling. Heaviness that is persistent for three months. She recalls a gradual onset while commuting one hour to work, and she drives to work. And her symptoms are moderate tingling in the bilateral ulnar forearms and hands that are worse with driving, riding a stationary bike, and at night, typically at two or three in the morning, she wakes up with these pain and, or, or tingling and numbness that's painful um, uh, in the middle of the, uh, middle of the night. Her heaviness increases when putting the dishes away and when she paint water, paints watercolors. Um, overall, she's pretty depressed about this. And you're going to find this about these patients. These patients are, are, are kind of in that, in that part of healthcare where no one really knows what's going on with them, so they end up in your clinic. And that's pretty common for thoracic outlet because no one knows what to do, so they end up sending them to the physical therapist. Now, how do you approach this problem? And we're, our answer to that is systematically. So I'm going to take you through a way of thinking. And you may have seen this before. If you have, hang with it. But this is a way of approaching anything. And we subscribe to this pretty strongly. Think of, think of all of the different variables throughout, uh, we call it a continuum, of where our patients or our clients would engage with us. They may come to us because there's a pain generator. And the pain generator always has a motion segment that's relevant and specific to the pain generator because the tissue matters. We also talk about all of the, the neurological importance of controlling and motor control. So we talk about psychomotor control, we talk about somatosensory control and fundamental performance. We have to be able to address not just the pain generator but how we control the pain generator. And lastly, we have to guide and lead people into advanced performance and functional advancement. So some of our colleagues, and we have a colleagues here, uh, one of our colleagues on the line right now is from the Chicago White Sox, and he's really oftentimes working at higher level performance issues and backtracking into the pain generator. So let's talk about how we approach this. One of the first questions we ask for people who are showing up with pain is, how can we address their pain successfully? And what we have to do is a medical screen. A medical screen leads, creates a clinical examination so that we can arrive at a structural diagnosis. Our testing helps to helps people arrive at a structural diagnosis. When we have a structural diagnosis, we get to take a look at that, educate the patient about it, and then begin to manage that pain and dysfunction at the motion segment. 
whatever that motion segment is. It could be a segment, a motion segment of the spine, or it could be the radiohumeral joint. It, it, what's important is that we have to manage the pain generator. This is a diagnosis-specific management. And we often, the tools that we use are our hands, insofar that we use orthopedic manual therapy. We're trying to improve the chemistry at the joint because we use our hands and we understand how to make a difference inside of that joint system. Also, we can't stop at the functional diagnosis. We can't stop at the pain generator because there's more to it. There's the functional diagnosis or the context in which the mechanical environment in which the pain generator started or is being perpetuated. So when we treat the pain generator with our hands, very specific things, we also have to backtrack to make sure that we get accurate and good functional control. We can start the process with manual therapy, but we have to always backfill with teaching the joint and the nervous system how to control that joint. This is a diagnosis-inclusive approach, and what we do, we, we teach move, motion. We teach the motion segment how to behave. And this is often client-specific because the client's activities are going to help guide us in exactly how and what kind of strategies we employ. Ultimately, this comes down to a process of composite training. We include all of this training into a core series that we call sensory motor control, or SENMACOR. SENMACOR is a, a, a complete scientific approach and a systematic approach to diagnosing specific functional uh, movement dysfunctions and movement patterns, specific training in order to improve those. And if, let's just say, if our, college, our clients rather come to us wanting to simply improve performance, then we can approach it with a functional screen. That functional screen often leads to a recognition that there may be a pain generator and a structural diagnosis is necessary. So this, you can see this is an entire comprehensive approach that has to be underpinned with a biopsychosocial assessment. We have to know who we're dealing with. And we know from increasing bodies of knowledge and increasing presence in, our, in the literature that a biopsychosocial interpersonal management strategies are important to getting the clinical results that we need. So we put all of this together and try to and break this out into each piece of our approach so that you have a systematic approach to um, the content. So our courses are are always laid out very similarly. Anatomy and pathoanatomy, so that you understand the story and you have a clear image in your mind what, what's happening. Biomechanics, so you can explain it. Our history, we always find out the who, what, where, when, why, and to what extent. And examination, provocation, and function, because you want both the pain generator, but also want to be able to address the functional diagnosis. Structural diagnosis, functional diagnosis always including both, because you have to have both for a comprehensive uh, approach to this. Interpretation of the findings, of course, and then treatment and management. And we'll touch on all of this a little bit today. So when we talk about this course, the, the, this course specifically is a combination of the lower, thora lower cervical course, the thoracic spine and ribs course, the shoulder course, and the pain course. So we have four different courses coming together in one course so that we can address the, this region that, that is in the middle of all of it and one of those regions that is the, the, the place where a lot of symptoms and complaints and um, patients who are struggling uh, originate. Let's give an overview. So we're going to begin with a kind of a cervical thoracic junction anatomy and biomechanics. Then we take a look at the thoracic outlet anatomy related to the most common clinical pathology, thoracic outlet syndrome in this region. And then examination and differential diagnosis is taught from the most common to the least common pathologies. Specifically, we work on thoracic outlet syndrome, ribs, and the cervical thoracic junction. Management suggestions start with local treatment techniques because we, if we're using our hands as mechanical therapists to improve local physiology, we have to be able to know which techniques we want to employ when to, in order to initiate the healing responses that we're trying to get.
And the course ends with a specific treatment of shoulder girdle dysfunction, part of the horizontal and kinetic chain, which has significant influence on all of the above. So, you know, if you take a look at the past 30 years and you do a, a, a lit search, you're going to find that very few, there's very little research on this topic. But we do the best we can, take the research that we have, and we try to make sense of it and boil it back down into this, into this course. Now, anatomy matters a lot. Why? Pain and dysfunction. I already talked a little bit about the importance of the structure causing the pain and the function of the system that contributes or perpetuates the problem. This, for many people, is a giant black box of understanding. But there's something very, very important about the mechanics of this area. This is the confluence of what we, what we call the vertical chain and the horizontal chain. This is where all of the, the integrity of the spine, which supports the lower cervical spine, which also tracks and is the platform upon which the head moves, meets the perpendicular, uh, the horizontal chain. And the horizontal chain is that chain that supports all of the forces that are generated through the upper extremities. So you have, and we recognize this, that our arms are hanging from our neck, but more specifically, the cervical thoracic junction. We have these things coming together into this confluence of space, which defines why this area can be such a challenging area if it's symptomatic. So as I mentioned, all of these come across as a um, this uh, systematic approach, which allows us to frame it up and understand which of these we're going to um, uh, address and when. When I get back to that previous slide, when we talked about the vertical and horizontal chains, we recognize that the thoracic spine is stiff. And it's stiff for a very specific reason. It's the foundation upon which the cervical spine can move and which the, the arms, upper extremities, can have a solid foundation from which to generate force. It also protects the lungs. So it's a very, very solid area. There is a challenge with this, as I mentioned. If it's symptomatic, it's difficult to initiate a healing response because of the circulation, because there's just not a lot of movement. And we know that, that in, the, in the body, much of the circulation that we can create, much of the, the chemistry needed for healing revolves around motion. The right amount of motion. You can't have too much motion or you're going to have troubles. But we need to get things moving in this area. So when we begin to improve mobility in this area to some degree, we often see at the same time people have less symptoms, which is why a lot of our treatments are focused to the cervical thoracic junction. And the functional significance, as I mentioned, that this area is, also, is the caudal end of the cervical chain, which needs mobility, and the cranial end of the thoracic change, which needs rigidity. So you have two biomechanical systems coming together at one place, which any time you do that, it's almost like two waves crashing up upon one another. It creates a lot of turbulence. Additionally, the lower cervical spine has specific biomechanical properties. It has specific predictable ways of moving on one another. And we know this predictability which occurs all the way down to T4. When you learn this, it's going to make all of your mobilizations make a little bit more sense. Why you're mobilizing, what you're mobilizing, and how to do it appropriately. And the research in this area is that the mobility of the cervical spine, cervical thoracic spine, and adjoining ribs in patients with shoulder complaints are intrinsic causes of shoulder problems. So if you think about it, when we, when we look at all that's necessary to raise the upper extremity, to raise your arm up over your head or to throw a baseball, in this case, Scott, we're talking about the elevation chain. We know that the lower cervical spine, the cervical thoracic junction, and the thoracic spine all the way down to T6 can contribute, is contributing in some level, to our ability to raise our arm up over your head. So if we have a hypomobility or a lack of mobility in any of those segments, to include also the ribs, 
and to include also obviously kind of the control of the scapulothoracic articulation and the glenohumeral joint, all of these contribute to the elevation chain. And this has some relevance, which is why we have to include how the shoulder functions in our, in our patients with thoracic outlet syndrome. So the clinical significance, as I mentioned, treatment for function includes shoulder pathology. People with a painful shoulder may adopt a protracted shoulder, which may increase some of the symptoms in the thoracic outlet distribution um, like we're familiar with, like we'll talk about. Uh, there's the thoracic outlet, as I mentioned, the T4 syndrome, which we won't get into detail today. So for treatment for pain, what we do is local thoracic syndrome. We have to understand what's causing the pain in these specific structures. Their rib articulations, the zygopophyseal joints or facet joints, and of course the disc as a pain generator in any aspect of the spine. Treatment for sympathetic influence, we can work specifically and address the chronic lower cervical syndrome, the upper cervical syndrome, chronic headaches, and chronic upper extremity syndromes. All of these come together in the cervical thoracic junction. We talk about thoracic outlet. It may be the most underrated, overlooked, and misdiagnosed, and the most important and difficult manage, to manage peripheral nerve compression in the upper extremity. This is a big deal. It's a big deal because, as I mentioned, these are the patients that end up in our clinic wondering what is wrong with me and can anyone do something about it. Now, interesting, the name itself, thoracic outlet syndrome, states where the problem is, but not what the problem is. And you have to, we, we, we can all recognize that not every thoracic outlet syndrome patient is the same. So what is the actual incidence of TOS? Well, it's underrated and at the same time, it's uh, overdiagnosed. Another big issue is that there are multiple abnormalities, varying signs and symptoms, no root involvement, and each patient can present differently. Compression versus traction. Now, I'm gonna come back to this, but we're mechanics, all of us in this, in this room right now. We're all mechanics who are trained to be able to use our hands as mechanical tools in order to improve environments. When we talk about thoracic outlet as a compression or a traction problem, we have to keep recognizing that cervical rib versus the first rib. Very, very important. Scaling disturbances following a motor vehicle accident, costovertebral space, and thoracopectoral space. These are some of the, the areas, what we call um, uh, areas of predilection or, or areas that can become problematic areas. Here, our definition of the thoracic outlet is a space. It's the spine, kind of obvious, the uh, sternum, and the lateral aspect of the first rib. Um, the thoracic outlet, also the definition is some sort of irritation. Anytime there are symptoms, there's an irritation, neurovascular bundle, there are narrowing pathways. It can be non-ridicular, which drives us crazy if we're trying to find the ridicular. And our question is, is it a compression problem or could it be something different? So here are the categories. The major categories of thoracic outlet syndrome are vascular. This accounts for only about 1.5% of the total thoracic outlet syndrome patients. It's very difficult to treat conservatively. If you have a vascular problem, it's very difficult to treat conservatively. Often these cases end up with a surgeon in some way. The other category, major category, is neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome. A true neurogenic is only about 3.5%. A disputed neurogenic is 95%. And, 90, and this 95% of people responds to conservative care. So let's take a little bit uh, a different of this, uh, these neurogenic the true neurogenic and the, and the disputed neurogenic. The true neurogenic classifications include actual sensory symptoms uh, that include hand weakness, measurable objectifiable hand weakness, and muscle wasting. There, uh, oftentimes there is a cervical rib present, and EMG is one of those tests that will confirm that we do have an objectifiable problem, an objectifiable lesion with nerve damage. 
This often, uh, the compression often due to history of traumatic injuries or chronic and repetitive motion activities. So in this true neurogenic, you have a neurological, uh, an axonal impairment. In the disputed TOS, this is what we call the ore in the great thoracic mine. What that means is we can do something with this. We don't have permanent or objectifiable uh, measures of damage to the nervous system, but we do have transient symptoms that we're able to impact because we can improve the mechanical environment. So when we step back to take a look at the anatomy, we, as I mentioned, we have important structures, the neurovascular bundles arising through multiple areas of challenge. Let me put it this way. You have important structures, nervous and vascular structures, traversing through the areas that we've well defined in, in that are narrow and dynamic with movement, the anterior triangle, the posterior triangle, the costoclavicular space, and the thoracocorical pectoral space. When we talk neurovascular, we know, and I, and I don't want to drag anybody back through this, uh, this reminder of neuroanatomy, but remember double crush. And this is something that was very popular back in the 80s and 90s, but the double crush syndrome is fascinating. I want you to think about a single nerve cell. Now, if you have in your mind how big a nerve cell is, you might think, well, it's really, really tiny. I could barely see it. But if you think carefully about how large or how long a sensory or a motor nerve cell is that innervates the arm. How long do you think it is? Remember the cell body is in the dorsal root ganglion in the in case of the sensory nerve and in the motor nerve it's in the anterior, anterior horn of the spinal cord. That's the cell body of the nerve. The rest of the nerve, which is one cell, traverses all the way down through the arm. And any time it, re, it, it comes across a mechanical barrier so that it no longer functions like it used to, where it's a challenge to its circulation, you have the opportunity for symptoms to happen. So these neurovascular, and additionally in this area, you have the sympathetic components in the spine. So the success of the vascular supply that helps to nourish the nerves going down the arm has much to do with the success of the sympathetic components to begin governing and modulating appropriate circulation. And it's, it's complicated and oftentimes we use our, uh, in those very extreme cases, we use our, our pain physician colleagues to help us to integrate or sometimes calm some of these sympathetic ganglion in order to help us create a better environment for the treatments that we're doing. But one key concept I want, to I want you to take away from here is that this nerve, neurovascular bundle, has, to, has a course of, uh, has a pathway. And that pathway is, especially in the C8, T1 nerve root, has to come up, up from below the first rib, over the top of the first rib, under the, the cork, under the coracoid process in the pectoralis minor, and then eventually down the arm. That is a circuitous route. And what can happen is we can get tension or compression in either of these areas. So when we do a clinical, uh, when we start looking at clinical findings, we start to review the research and we realize that, there, that patients should have at least uh, three of the following four symptoms or signs. A history of aggravation of symptoms with the arm in elevated position, um, paresthesias origi originating from the spinal segments C8T1, supraclavicular tendons over the brachial plexus, and positive hands up abduction, external rotation test or stress test. This is what we know. Now, we also know that a detailed history and physical exam should aim at ruling out other reasons for these symptoms because often thoracic outlet syndrome remains a diagnosis of exclusion. So let's take quickly a, a look at the subject of evaluation because this is what paints a picture. All of our examination processes, and we teach this explicitly, is a who, what, when, where, why, and to what extent. And for thoracic outlet, for example, we're looking in this age category. T 
typically 20, 30, 20 to 50 years old, um, feel, uh, females more frequently than males by almost a four to one ratio. If we take a look at what, as I mentioned, the what is the vascular, a true neurological, or disputed neurological. So there's three major groups. If we get down to the where, we'll realize that the lower trunk, the, lo um, the lower trunk is the most susceptible because of what I just described as the mechanical route of the, the neurovascular bundles over the top of the first rib, which is why thoracic outlet in the disputed uh, neurological, which is what we have the ability to make a difference in, is most common. So the referred pain oftentimes can be in the axilla, the medial forearm, oftentimes in the fourth and fifth fingers, and this concept of numbness. The numbness is because the nerve is not functioning properly. It's not that it's yet pathological and objectifiable, but it's not functioning properly because it's not getting the right circulation. So the why, as I mentioned, is because of a change in pressure of the nerve. It's an increase in the intrafascicular compression or a decrease in the intraneural blood supply. Either way, you're changing pressures mechanically. And if you drop the, the exchange of this chemistry, if you change the exchange of this chemistry in a way, you're going to have symptoms. Tension is one of the, is the key concept that allows us to really make the biggest difference when we start looking at the treatment. Because treatment is going to be simple if you understand the mechanics behind this. Because of the ventral ramus of C8, uh, C7 and 8, the axons of T1, 2, 3, and 4, because of their, their, uh, their more caudal arrangement, they have to ascend up and make a U-turn over that first rib and descend underneath the coracoid. This can create, as I mentioned, this can create the ischemia venous pooling and a decrease in axon function. So here's another illustration of it. So it has to come up from below, down and underneath. And we're going to talk about clinically how we can make a difference with this mechanical environment. So mechanical provocation determines symptoms and function is our clinical examination. And our clinical examination for disputed, the clinical testing for the disputed includes all of these tests. We won't go into detail today, of course. And then in the true neurological, these are probably familiar to you already, but we will cover these in all of these in the, um, in the live course. So our CREX release test, this is a clinical pearl. Remember when I mentioned that if there is a tension problem, Attention because we have these nerves originating from down below, the C8, T1, the uh, first uh, of the thoracic um, nerve roots. As they come up over the top of the first rib, this gets pulled or tensioned down because of the position of the shoulder. If we take the position of the shoulder and elevate it, in other words, take the tension off of this neurovascular bundle, oftentimes we can promote or provoke symptoms. It's the exact same symptoms that people often complain of in the middle of the night. When you create symptoms, you already can begin to educate the patient that this is a very mechanical problem. And it has much to do with how the nervous system is managing and the, and the neurovascular bundle is managing the forces. So what happens are, are when you take this off and it provokes their symptoms, it's a positive test. It's good to have this positive test because then you know how to manage it. And we'll talk more in detail about that. Another important test is back to the position of the first rib. And this is a lingering test where we do a rotation and we do a side bending. It's called the Rotation Lateral Flexion Test, originated by Lindgren. And it gives us a sense of the position of the first rib, whether it's elevated, which would increase that tension over the top, or if it's more appropriately positioned. Because if it's elevated, we already know it's going to be more of a mechanical contributor to the dysfunction, to the pathology or the tension in that neurovascular bundle, which will create the symptoms. This first rib is a key player in conservative management of thoracic outlet syndrome. So we can also test this first rib by exerting a pressure in a more uh, caudal 
medial and slightly ventral, trying to emphasize this costal vertebral joint. And we teach you exactly how to do this. So when we come up with this diagnosis, ultimately when we have a diagnosis, we're talking about management. How do we take a nervous system that is now sensitized to the extent that it's beginning to have symptoms often over a long, prolonged period of time and introduce a way to desensitize it and right size or appropriately reestablish mechanics? Well, let's get back to our case. Remember, we talked about this nice lady who has the symptoms down her arm into her hand, and we're talking about posture, forward head posture. We find that she's got a left shoulder is slightly higher. She's got a negative cervical examination. This release test that I just mentioned is positive. She has a Roos test, which we, wouldn't, we won't cover today. She has an ulnar nerve neural tension test, positive, especially in the left. She's got a Lindgren test, and she's got rib testing. So we already know that she's got ribs, or a first rib specifically, that is positioned in a way that is causing a mechanical, contributing to a mechanical tension on this neurovascular bundle. Additionally, she's got some uh, pain with axial rotation and prone. She's got some segmental issues in the upper thoracic spine, which we'll be able to address. And segmental rotation testing also shows limitations in the upper thoracic spine. A very rigid area, relatively, and in her case, more so limited, and we have an opportunity to improve that. This is key. A diagnosis is part of healing, and a symptom suffers less when it knows where it belongs. So your ability to teach this to your patient is a key concept. Be able to teach well. Storytellers have the strong ability to begin to initiate a healing environment because people are no longer afraid. So education is one of the very, very first steps in helping people who have complaints of either cervical thoracic junction dysfunction, or thoracic outlet syndrome. So storytelling, as I mentioned, education and guidance. If we're master storytellers, we help people along the path to being adherent to our treatment plans and to a better success in sticking with what we're trying to help them achieve. One of the first things we ask our patients and help them understand is what exactly is pain? Or for that matter, what is any symptom? And I would offer that that symptom is a chemical problem. It's a chemical problem because somewhere in the nervous system, the nerves responsible for sensing either pain or pressure or numbness and tingling have registered in the brain and said, hey, I've got a problem. Oftentimes, this chemical problem is from a mechanical situation. The best example, of course, is if you sprain your ankle, what happens to your ankle? It swells. Well, if you take a nerve uh, and or a neurovascular bundle and you put it under tension for a prolonged period of time because of a postural adaptation, you may have the initiation of a chemical sequence which causes the symptoms. And it's a very, very useful way of thinking about this because our job is to try to improve the mechanics so that we can therefore improve the chemistry. When we improve the chemistry, we decrease symptoms. And lastly, pain is psychosomatic because unfortunately we know that, uh, it's not unfortunate, it's just the truth, that people respond to the symptoms. And they respond in all kinds of ways, with fear or sometimes depression, and it's rightfully so because these are very challenging things to deal with. So a psychosomatic understanding is important and recognize, and I draw this for every patient on the board. I draw a brain and I help them understand that psychosomatic does not mean that we're making it up. It just means that our brain has to interpret the signal. And we may interpret it in an inappropriate way or a way that creates a lot of fear, or we can begin to interpret the symptom as a way, as a need to do something with the mechanics. If we can change the mechanics of something, we can change the chemistry. That's a key concept because the chemical, the, the chemistry is what is generating the pain. This is a useful story. I start every single treatment session or every uh, evaluation with this so that our pa my patients understand exactly why I'm doing what I'm doing. So with regards to the syndrome, we can do soft tissue, which is very mechanical. We can do MLD, 
There's a chemical intervention that we might be able to do with iontophoresis or phonophoresis. Cerex release maneuver, which we would teach in the live course. It's a, it's a very effective way to try to get the nervous system remodeled to understand how uh, and revascularize so that it can, it can do a better job responding to healing which is also very mechanical, rib mobilizations, neural flossing, sympathetic management. You can see that there's a lot of mechanical treatments that we do. Additional mechanical treatments, soft tissue techniques, gapping techniques, local traction, joint specific techniques for extension, joint specific techniques and neuromuscular re-education. Some of these techniques look like this, where we provide a caudally directed force towards the first rib in order to de Oftentimes when we do this, by the way, you begin to activate the, the patient's symptoms in their arm. And this is what we say, don't stop. Let that symptom pattern run its course. Let that, quote, revascularization or, or reperfusion, if you will, of that nerve happen in order to create a pattern that creates ultimately healing. Symptom management, we can do the same thing by having them sit and support it in a manner that allows for this tension to be off of the brachial plexus and the neurovascular bundles. If you do this, they're going to start to have symptoms in their arms. That's okay. Coach them. Let them know. It's all right. Let these symptoms run the course. And it's almost like a nerve waking up again. You know, when you cross your legs and, and, you, and you come out of crossing your legs and next thing you know you have this tremendous tingling in your arms, stay with it. It will help to bring a reperfusion effect into the nerves, although it can be very uncomfortable for a small period of time, upwards into five, sometimes six minutes. Coach them to stay with it night after night after night, and they won't be waking up in the middle of the night anymore. Sympathetic management, so many things we can do to try to get input into the sympathetic nervous system through mechanical means. So as I mentioned, there are so many different ways to approach this. We're talking about the pain generator, but we're also talking about function. And we didn't get a chance to talk too much about how to normalize muscle function in this case, but that's a foregone conclusion that we bring it all back together. And how we communicate with patients is going to be important also. So in summary, thoracic outlet syndrome is complex. There's structure and function. Both deserve your attention. Patients suffer in part because they don't understand it. Fear, and oftentimes these people have had multiple providers, multiple people telling them what's wrong, and, and they've, they've not had great success until finally they get to your clinic and you finally have a comprehensive understanding of this. Remember, we are experts guiding our clients through this experience. Provide a diagnosis that matters. It matters because you understand the mechanics of it and you can teach it appropriately. We are mechanics that improve chemistry and thus decrease symptoms. We help modulate and create healing because we improve circulation through mechanical means. And if you know the right kind of tool to apply at the right time, you'll have a tremendous improvement in your ability to get great results. Develop a comprehensive understanding and a systematic approach. You need to make a difference. And this is something we, we try to invite for everybody. A systematic approach to complex problems often simplifies it. It demystifies it. It makes a complex problem like this um, much more easy to understand. And when you understand it better, you're able to better teach it and apply the right tools in order to get the best results. So consider joining us for an additional learning. We have online course on this topic. We also have hybrid learning experience so that you can learn the hands-on techniques in person and just check out our website to learn more. So big thanks to all of you who have attended this course, this uh, webinar. If you have any questions, just contact us at the website. We'll be happy to help.